item and then she can take over. This meeting is being recorded. Tech Forum, we conduct uh, such meetings every fortnight. Uh, organization is just six months old. We have mandates, uh, which I have already circulated our newsletter as well as Tech Forum brochure. Uh, the membership is 1000 rupees a year. I request all the participants to become member because very shortly we will be opening it only for the members. Uh, good response coming up in the last uh, six months and we have around 70 members now and on our list we have at least 300 participants so far. So welcome uh, to the different topic today and I will request I will start introduction of Madam. Uh, Madam uh, Dr. Anuya Nisal, she is a principal scientist at CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. She is also founder of Serigen Medi Products Private Limited. Uh, she works for NCL. Uh, so, Dr. Anuya is principal scientist in polymer science and engineering department at uh, NCL. She did her PhD in chemical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, and her master's uh, material science engineering from University of Delaware, USA. Working as a scientist uh, with the GE Plastics, John F. Uh, Welch Technology Center. At NCL, she leads a group of performing scientists research in the area of polymer, biomaterial, medical devices, and tissue engineering. She has successfully led and executed several products with government agencies such as CSR, DBT, DST, SCRB, BIRAC, etc. Her work has resulted in 24 peer-reviewed general publications and six patent Form, family, uh, uh, families. She has also collaborated with the leading local and global industries and has been actively involved in translating technologies from the fab. She is also the lead inventor for the technology patent on silk on which she is going to talk today and the products that she has developed. Uh, I have. I was just searching on the internet. I could see a lot of Chinese. Uh, when I was interacting with her, she told me that there are many in India who are working on such research. But uh, starting a startup uh, on this uh, technology, she is the only one in the country. So we are all Tech Forum is proud of uh, the the scientist Pune who is Pune based. Uh, so she has started uh, this startup, Serigen. Uh, made it products in Pune. Earlier it was in the NCL Innovation Park, but now they have a separate uh, entity now in city. So uh, there are a lot of things which I have shared about her. But without uh, spending much time, I will request Dr. Anuya Nisal uh, to start her presentation on a very innovative topic, silk uh, for industrial applications or medical applications. Over to Dr. Nisal. Yeah. Uh I just begin by sharing my screen once. So. Your mic is muted, madam. Um, one second. Silk from textile to medical application. Um, my mic, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now we can hear. Like All the... participants are requested to mute their mics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Abde, for uh, uh, basically giving me this opportunity to present my work, inviting me here uh, for this tech forum uh, meeting. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about our work on silk. Uh, I'm hearing some echo. Maybe if uh, some, yeah. you can mute the mics, it would be easier. Uh, all, all are all are requested to mute their mic, please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, silk uh, from textiles to medical applications. That is the topic I'm talking about. 
as uh, mr abdi mentioned i am a polymer i am a principal scientist in the polymer science and engineering department at csi national chemical laboratory uh, very briefly for people who are not familiar uh, ncl is a premier materials and chemicals research institute uh, we are part of council of scientific and industrial research which has 38 laboratories nationally working in different areas and uh, the mandate for the lab is to do good chemical science for the betterment of the society and uh, this was the uh, purpose of the laboratory that was defined by dr shanti swarup bhatnagar and other visionaries way back in the 1940s and uh, the lab continues to be motivated um, uh, by this mandate so um, uh, basically in my group uh, although i'm talking about silk we do uh, focus a lot on biomaterials and bioengineering Uh, so basically we i'm a material scientist by training uh, with a specialization in the area of polymers so uh, the focus is to design and synthesize new materials uh, look at uh, developing uh, so being an engineer by training we develop various protocols about how materials can be processed and we have uh, really state of the art uh, scientific tools of characterization such as uh, 2d and mr spectroscopy or uh, small angle neutron scattering small angle x ray scattering uh, ftr spectroscopy so we combine all of this to understand what kind of structures we have in the materials what kind of properties that brings in and that basically defines the performance of uh, various materials uh, i also have a very active group on uh, cell biomaterial interactions so uh, we do tissue culture in the lab using mostly animal cell lines stem cells and um, uh, various even primary cells from patients so we look at how cells interact with these new materials and uh, uh, use basically all of this knowledge together to contribute towards development of uh, medical devices uh, so for example um, and as i mentioned like our lab has a major focus on translational research we don't focus too much on fundamental although that definitely is the focus we have about uh, uh, six phd students in my group who uh, work with me in the area of doing some fundamental research but we do a lot of translational research uh, so in the area of covid we have been doing two projects uh, one is uh, about uh, last year so way back in 2020 when the covid pandemic actually struck uh in may 2020 itself in within less than one and a half to two months we actually developed the um, know how for making nasopharyngeal swabs which are actually used to collect the uh, 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 uh you know testing sample from the patient's uh, cavity nasal or the nasopharyngeal cavity and india that time was heavily reliant on importing some of these swabs and um, import of the swabs was a problem at that point of time so we worked with an indian industry to actually commercialize uh, this technology quickly and they uh, set up a facility to produce more than 1 lakh swabs uh, per day and the company is still selling those so that is the kind of um, motivation that we have we work extensively on translating scientific research so with that brief background i'll tell you a little bit about uh, silk today in my talk i'll begin with a very uh, broad introduction to silk what what does the term mean what uh, what kind of chemical structure does it have i'll talk about uh, silk for textile applications and uh, briefly uh, tell you about a project that we did in collaboration with csrt and mysur another institute which was also a technology that was transferred uh, i'll tell you a little more about uh, silk in medical applications which is our area of interest and focus uh, some exciting applications that we are looking at and uh, then finally talk about uh, my spin off company serigen medi products uh, and what uh, serigen is currently doing <coughs> um so to begin when you think of the word silk uh, we've all uh, heard uh, this word and what comes to your mind is a royal bright lustrous shiny fabric which has dominated the textile market not only in india but globally for several decades and centuries so it's a it's a very ancient textile material more than 5000 years ago it was uh, discovered and even today in all our weddings or any uh, functions you will see that silk is the predominant material of choice for all um, uh, the brides and the bridegrooms and uh, their costumes right so the royalty of this material is still maintained so what exactly is this material 
So silk is basically a fibrous material secreted by more than 34,000 different species of spiders and insects. Uh, it is a very common term that is used because uh, basically silk is uh, all, what is common in all these organisms is that they have very specialized glands which allow it to synthesize this material. They have glands that transmit this material from the synthesized gland to an exterior opening, which you can actually consider to be like a spinneret. And it comes in the outside from the um, mouth or the opening in the form of a fiber, it solidifies, right? So this uh, silk can either be uh, in air or it can also be aquatic silk. So there are some of these insects actually spin the silk under the water. So we have also been working with an aquatic uh, silk kind of a material. Now, why, why do these organisms secrete silk? Every organism has its own different reasons, right? Spider, for example, uh, uses uh, silk to basically do uh, catch a prey. So the web of the spider is so thin and it has a sticky protein around itself. So if there is a fly or any other insects that's flying by, it's not able to see the spider web and it actually gets attached onto that. And that is how spider is using that to catch the prey. Or it also uses silk to save itself from another attack. So when somebody is attacking it, the spider just drops down by spinning a silk fiber by the weight. And that has basically been the concept uh, for developing the Spider-Man or uh, so and so forth, that uh, this thin thread is actually able to support a huge amount of uh, weight. So spider by itself also can secrete various different types of silk. So if you look at the spider silk web, it has these arms that go radially outwards. That is one type of silk. The one that is actually going circularly round in the web is another type of silk. The third type of silk is when it actually spin, uh, comes down. So um, these are different types of proteins that these insects actually secrete. The silkworm secretes a silk cocoon around itself in which it actually uh, sits inside that cocoon and metamorphosizes into a moth. And um, it uses this silk for protection. So basically when it is trans, uh, metamorphosizing or transforming into the moth, it uh, remains inside this cocoon for about seven to eight days. And then it will fly out in the form of a butterfly. So it's like a protection or a housing and so on and so forth. So each organism has been uh, developing these silk for various different applications, right? So why did it catch our attention and fancy? And why has it been our uh, uh, focus of research for this last uh, whole decade? Is because India is the largest, second largest producer of silkworm silk. So I'm going to talk today mostly about silkworm silk. That is what has been of interest in the lab. China is the world's largest producer of silkworm silk. India is the second largest. Uh, we produce more than 33,000 metric tons in 2020-21. So that's a huge volume of material uh, that we are producing. Uh, we're the only country globally which produces four different types of silk. Okay, so mulberry, tussar, eri, and muga. There is no other country globally that has this entire bioresource of silk that uh, we are seeing. And uh, sericulture employs more than 8.7 million people uh, in India. So it's an extremely mature industry. Uh, you have silk farmers, you have a central silk board, which is actually guiding these silk farmers. And just like CSI, the CSB also has a lot of institutes that are spread throughout India, which actually train and support the farmers in their uh, sericulture or uh, silk-based agriculture. That is uh, what it is. So this is a typical life cycle of a silkworm. So the silkworm, uh, uh, basically, uh, I'll start from the egg. So once the a larva hatches out of the egg. This larva is of a very small size. It's about a mm or two mm in size. And this larva feeds exclusively on mulberry leaves. So I'm going to talk mostly about mulberry silk or bombyx mori silk as it is common, uh, as it is scientifically called. Uh, once it feeds on the leaves, it grows in size. So this is about five to six centimeter in size. So it's really large. And this larva then spins a cocoon around itself and it uh, metamorphosizes into the moth. The moth then flies out of the cocoon. Uh, it again, each moth is actually capable of laying more than 400 to 500 eggs. And this is how the life cycle continuously uh, goes on, right? So our interest, as I mentioned, is on Bombyx mori silkworm or Marbury uh, silkworm. 
what differentiates this from the other silkworms is that this mulberry silkworm exclusively feeds on mulberry leaves so it will die but it will not eat anything else so it has these sensory organs by which it can actually sense the mulberry leaves so smell uh, basically it uh, is what it um, senses so it will eat only the mulberry leaves now most other silkworms are actually not um, domesticated these are wild silkworms they feed on uh, various different trees and whatever is available in the wild uh, that is why the quality of silk that they produced is not very reproducible whereas because the mulberry silkworm is completely domesticated so a huge portion of the sericulture that i'm talking about is for mulberry silk uh, where what the farmer does is he has a farm which is primarily cultivating the mulberry trees he has the worms actually in an uh, a room which is maintained at 25 degrees so there is an ac there is a 25 degree temperature there is a humidity control that the farmer maintains and he has trays in which he places these worms and all he does is he plugs these mulberry leaves on and puts them on the tray so that the worm keeps on eating that so it's an extremely domesticated uh, form of the uh, farming that is now today practiced in india now each of this uh, worm as i mentioned produces a cocoon around itself this cocoon is typically uh, about 3 uh, cm to 4 cm in size uh, what you are seeing here and this is made up of two threads okay so uh, uh, e uh, this each thread of silk is about 4 to 6 kilometers long so the silkworm has two silk glands on both sides of the body and both of these come out near the mouth of the silk so you can see here that i'm saying there are two threads that are coming so they come close and there is a coating around it which is called as sericin okay so sericin is this glue that is actually holding the cocoon together it is a, a glue like protein which is, forms about 25 to 30% of the weight of the cocoon is made up of sericin whereas fibroin which forms 70 to 75% by weight is the main structural component of silk so silk uh, this fibroin is what gives silk actually the um, properties such as its uh, mechanical strength its shine its luster and so on right so both sericin and fibroin are uh, uh, used in the uh, you find a lot of research around both these materials today and in our lab also we work both with sericin and fibroin but i am going to primarily talk about our work on fibroin today i'm going to leave sericin out uh, and i'll tell you a little bit more about what this fibroin protein is okay so the fibroin protein uh, has a very interesting structure there are more than 5200 amino acids which are linked together so it's a huge molecule about 350 kilo dalton in molecular weight um what is unique is it has a very repeat kind of sequence that forms about 70% of the chain okay so um, glycine alanine glycine alanine glycine serine so this is the amino acid sequence so you know as you all know proteins are made up of amino acids and it is this sequence of amino acids that actually gives the protein its properties so in silkworm uh, you can see that this repeat sequence of glycine alanine glycine alanine glycine serine allows the protein to actually crystallize onto itself and uh, that gives silk the extensive mechanical strength that it has so if you compare the mechanical strength the tensile strength of silk is about 0.5 gigapascal which is the only one that close comes close synthetically produced fiber is kevlar which is about it's a polyaramid fiber it has about 3.6 gigapascal but silk also has this interesting property that in between these crystalline domains of silk you have these amorphous chains of silk that actually link it together and because of that it also has a very good elongation elongation comes like your rubber band you know you can actually elongate it significantly and goes back so silk actually can do that to about 15% and this balance of having a very high modulus as well as having a good elongation is not possible in any of the synthetic polymeric fibers that we have developed so far or the man made fibers that uh, you can call so the nature has actually mastered the chemical sequence in such a way that you have an excellent balance of mechanical properties and that is what uh, differentiates this material from um, most other applications okay 
so um that was a very very broad and a brief introduction to uh, what silk is so uh, next i'll just tell you a little bit about one of the applications that we worked on uh, a few years ago in uh, silk in textiles right so dyeing of textiles is an extremely uh, polluting industry globally right the uh, this is a very recent 2021 article where um, talks about how the asian rivers are turning black and our colorful closets are basically to blame that so when the silkworm produces the cocoon uh, you'll typically see that the silk is white in color the cocoon or the fiber is white in color or colorless you can call it um, some of the silkworms can produce slightly beige or maybe uh, light or yellow or ochre color those kinds of colors are possible naturally with the silkworm but definitely when you want to use it in a textile application you want to color it into a bright red bright blue bright yellow and uh, use uh, that and you want that color to be stable through all your washes and uh, through the dry cleaning that you do for all these fabrics right so when you uh, want to do that dyeing is what is uh, done globally and it is an extremely toxic or it's an uh, industry which has found to be very devastating to the environment and it also then uh, through these rivers and water bodies it's actually coming back into our food chain right through the fish that we consume or things like that therefore uh, this was a very interesting work that we did in collaboration with uh, central sericultural research institute uh, there is a scientist there dr kanika trivedi uh, who retired from there now but uh, she uh, was looking at this and she did a very interesting experiment so i told you that this bombyx mori silkworm feeds on the mulberry leaves and it produces this white cocoon what she did was she actually sprayed a color on the leaves so she sprayed a pink color on the leaves and when the silkworms actually ate these pink colored leaves they produced a pink colored cocoon so that was very nice because now what that means is that you don't have to dye the fabric after it is uh, colored you can directly get colored cocoons from the silkworm the dyes were not toxic to the silkworm the growth of the silkworm was normal and uh, there were several advantages with this right so uh, what basically happens is that you have the um, silkworm so this is like the mouth or the um, elementary canal opening for the silkworm so it's consuming the dye molecules along with these mulberry leaves and what she showed is that if i i told you that these silkworms eat the mulberry leaves for about 7 days so if i feed them every day if i feed them with pink color the cocoon comes out very dark pink if i feed it only for one day i get light pink so essentially it allows you to bring in different shades of pink also into the silk right so very interesting from a textile point of view and uh, that was um, very exciting to her and uh, this work she had uh, already published so what we did was she came and uh, spoke to us about this that once this pink color worked she wanted to try all different sorts of colors and try to produce various different color uh, combinations to uh, make the silk sarees but what she observed is that some dyes actually color the silk some don't some are just excreted out from the body some are toxic to the silkworm so she was trying to understand what is the science that actually governs behind a silkworm consuming that dye to it going into the silk gland so we did a very nice uh, study over here and i'll tell you a little bit about the anatomy of the silkworm to understand uh, more and appreciate this work so what happens is that the elementary canal of the silkworm is actually lined by a membrane so you can consider it to be like a filter now if your dye molecule is very small in size it can pass through this filter right so it's like a chalni so if it is small in size it can pass through if it is large it will stay on the top so if the molecule is small in molecular weight which is about 300 to 400 grams it can actually come out from this membrane into the blood of the silkworm so our body has these nice arteries and veins through which the blood flows but for silkworm its entire body is filled with the blood and all the organs are suspended in this pool of uh, blood if you can consider it that way right so what happens is when the silk uh, dye molecule moves from the elementary canal into the blood of the silkworm the silk gland is actually suspended in this pool 
So the dye molecule, there is another filter over here through which this dye molecule has to transport and enter into the silk gland. Once it enters into the silk gland, it has to somehow interact with the silk protein. There has to be some kind of an interaction which allows this uh, molecule to uh, work. And then if that interaction is strong enough, you will then eventually get a colored silk cocoon, right? So we identified two different protocols. We said that, see, if you look at this molecule, which has a very large structure. So these are common dyes that are used in textiles. So we selected a series of them. And we showed that if you have a large molecule, which has molecular weights of the order of 600, they cannot actually pass through that. So they remain in the elementary canal. And therefore, you the cocoon that you get is still white. But when you reduce the molecular weight, at 300 or 400, you start seeing that they can actually transmit from the gland elementary canal into the blood and then into the gland. So you can see that the silk gland actually also shows color. So this is the control gland, the first picture, and the three others are three different dyes that we used. So the dye molecule has actually transmitted from the elementary canal into the, the uh, uh, this. Further, we also did a very interesting study where we showed that if you have a balance of hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity in the dye molecular structure, only then will you get a color silk cocoon which can retain its color, right? And uh, this was a very interesting scientific um, input that we've been able, and uh, that helped CSRTI also uh, work more on other colors. Interestingly, CSRTI also licensed their technology to RMKV silk. Those who are from Chennai will definitely know about this company. Uh, uh, and this is like a field trial that they did with silk farmers where the, uh, the pink colored cocoon was produced and they were able to convert it into a raw silk and convert it into a fabric. The color was also found to be as good as um, what you would do with the dyeing process. So it was found to be very stable in the fabric. And RMKV Silk actually started selling green silk sarees um, uh, organic, they used to call it organic green silk saris for um, their marketing this. So CSRT is working with them to bring in other colors uh, to the market as well. So this was one very exciting um, textile application of this material that uh, we worked on. And uh, uh, obviously there is a lot more that you can do with this concept of feeding silk. And this area has really picked up. So a lot of researchers globally are looking at uh, not only dye molecules, but can you feed in drug molecules to silk? Can you add any other nanofillers to silk? And how do they work? Do they can transform the properties of the silk that is produced? And there's an exciting amount of literature there, uh, which you can actually uh, go and read if you find that of uh, interest. Moving on uh, to the medical application, which is uh, not something very new. So silk has been used to stitch wounds for several um, uh, centuries. So even if you look at our ancient literature, there are reports talking about how the silk thread can be used to stitch uh, wounds, okay? And more than 100 years ago, um, J and J, Johnson and Johnson, which is, uh, I'm sure each one of you has used a Band-Aid from Johnson and Johnson, right? So Johnson and Johnson was a company uh, which in 1887 itself started selling sterile silk based sutures in the market. And um, since then, surgeons have used the silk suture. They're generally used for internal surgeries where you have abdomen, stomach, or uh, those kinds of things. Not used generally for cuts on the surface because cuts on the surface heal much faster, whereas silk is going to stay in the body for some time. So they are going to, they use it generally for internal organ surgeries. And uh, today, if you look at, there are many companies, not only in India, but also in the US and also globally, who are selling silk-based sutures, okay? So this is a material that is not new for medical applications. There is a huge history. Uh, silk farmers themselves are very well trained because even India has a lot of industries who work in that. So uh, silk for medical application is not such a new concept uh, as such, okay? So I'll just tell you a little bit about what happens to the silkworm silk when you use it in the body. So uh, if you uh, look at our silk sari, uh, I said that it is made out of this protein. So it is it has this stable amide bond that is present along the protein chain. Okay, so the C double bond or NH is a bond that is present in all the proteins. Now. 
when when you immerse a silk sari in water let's say you get drenched in the rain your sari does not dissolve in water right so nor does the cocoon and the cocoon is uh, basically you know it is the protection for the silkworm from all these things so even if you have an acid rain it does not dissolve right you can also use your silk in um, dry cleaning which means that if you use various organic solvents uh, for uh, this nothing happens to the silk so silk has very very good chemical resistance okay and that is another interesting property of silk but in our body when you use the silk you um, uh, you know the silk thread uh, in just if there was just water in the body we should have been fine but there are also materials that are enzymatic in nature so we have enzymes that are present in the body and these enzymes have the ability to cleave this peptide bond the c double bond or nh so the enzymes some enzymes like collagenase or uh, proteases and things like that they can actually break this bond which means that this whole long chain of 5200 amino acids that i told you will actually break down or be chopped into smaller and smaller peptides and you know eventually result in amino acids and so on so that is called as a bioabsorbable or a biodegradable material which means that if you implant it into the body it's not going to stay in your body forever right over time it will break it will absorb it will resorb or there are different concepts that are uh, used or different terminologies that are used in the literature for this where people call it biodegradable material a bioabsorbable material a bioresorbable material a bioerodible material so various different uh, terms you can use for this right so silk is biodegradable uh, it is also biocompatible now um, what do i mean by that by that in a very layman term i mean that it is safe and it is not toxic to the human body so when you put silk inside into your body initially there is an inflammatory response from the body okay so body sees that this is a foreign material and you have certain immune cells that actually try to attack the scaffold so you will see that first few weeks is when you will see there is some inflammation around the implant but this inflammation typically subsides over the month or so over 6 months you will see that there is no inflammation at all and you will start seeing some amount of degradation of the silk now depending on where you implant silk in the body in the first 6 months more or less the silk remains as it is but over the 6 to 24 month time you will see that it will slowly continue to degrade and about 2 years down the line when you see you will not find silk at the site at which you implanted it okay and this ent- through this entire process it does not cause any toxicity to your body that is why it is considered to be safe and non toxic or a biocompatible material <coughs> now i told you that um, silk uh, thread as such is uh, being used for uh, suturing applications for more than 100 years right so what is new and why is it so exciting now for the researchers so in the last two decades or uh, 25 to 30 years what people have been able to do is develop protocols to convert this silk fiber into a solution so just like you dissolve your salt and into a or your molecule into water here you can dissolve this protein into the water now i told you initially that silk is not water soluble so there there have been strategies or there are uh, chemical ways now by which i can actually break some of the hydrogen bonds that are formed in the molecule which forms this crystalline domains so i actually break all that crystalline domains and i now have a process in my lab or even globally a lot of researchers are doing this now is that you convert the silk into a solution now this is very interesting because the moment i can convert this fibroin into a solution i can then process it into different forms so it need not only be used in the form of a fiber i can use it in different different ways so uh, this is a very very brief activity uh, this is a, a you know a very um, a smallest way or a shortest way in the interest of time that i can tell you about what we have done with silk so see here i have casted that silk solution to make a film out of it now this film is not porous not uh, this and i can also control the amount of crystalline structure that i have in the silk over here 
which means that if I implant the silk in the body, it can degrade really fast if it is mostly not crystalline. If it is very crystalline, it degrades very slowly. Now, this is something you cannot do with any of the other natural proteins like collagen. And that is why silk has gained a lot more importance. Second is, what we have done is we have made these nanofibers out of silk. Now, these nanofibers, I'm showing one picture here, the small black dots that you see, these are actually gold nanoparticles that we have decorated on the surface of this mat. And these gold nanoparticles have various, they are decorated with different chemical uh, moieties. So they can actually tune how cells interact with the silk. We have also chemically modified silk with glycopolypeptides or other molecules, which shows that then the liver cells actually grow much better on the silk once it is modified with glycopolypeptide. So I can make these nanoporous mats of silk, which can be used in various applications. I have also prepared functional coatings of silk. So uh, here we have um, shown a way to make crack resistant coatings out of silk. And uh, I, this we are using for a breast implant application. So this is a work that we're doing. Uh, we started when uh, Dr. Kopikar, who is um, a renowned oncosurgeon in uh, Pune for breast cancer. So he approached us that he is actually using these silicone implants to reconstruct the shape and size of the breast uh, in women. And uh, after he removes all the cancerous tissue and he sees a huge failure rate. So our idea or hypothesis here was that if I coat the silk implant, uh, the silicone implant with silk, can I improve its performance in the patient? And uh, we've been able to do very nice work here. We have a patent application on that also, which uh, shows that we can combine a regular process like dip coating with electro spinning that is non-woven uh, mat of silk to form a self-reinforced coating of silk, which is also crack resistant, which um, which can be used to load in other drug molecules. And this is one active area of interest in uh, my group presently. Uh, with uh, Dr. Asmita Prabhune, who is now retired from NCL, we have looked at uh, gelation of silk. So we form these very nice hydrogels of silk. So these are structures which can actually hold a lot of water in them. And uh, the hydrogels are being looked at in tissue engineering applications because um, uh, uh, you know, they have a physical as well as a structural similarity to your biological tissues in the body. So here we showed that if I add a biosurfactant molecule to silk, I can actually result in a hydrogel in few minutes of time. And these hydrogels are extremely biocompatible. Uh, the biosurfactants actually bring in properties like anti-cancer, antimicrobial, and um, antiviral. And we are trying to exploit some of these in the tissue engineering applications, right? So um, taking a step back, I told you that I can process silk into a variety of different forms. And that is very, very exciting. So why is that exciting? is because of this possibility of tissue regeneration. So let's say you have an organ in the body which is non-functional. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, there is a defect in your organ. It could be a liver. It could be, um, you know, uh, like breast or something else. And what uh, is the way to do that today is you rely uh, heavily on transplantation. So you wait for a cadaveric organ to become available. The cadaveric organ has to match all the properties to the properties of the patient. And only then can you actually uh, put that implant and into your body or that organ into your body. And that is how it repairs, right? But the idea here is that, can I put in a material, a biomaterial or a scaffold into the body of the patient such that it takes all these neighboring cells. It supports the growth of these cells the cells then help to repair this defective organ. It results in regeneration of this tissue and eventually the uh, organ is brought back to its own functionality. The biomaterial may remain there or it may also absorb or resorb like I told you before, right? So in an ideal scenario, you don't want the biomaterial after it has done its job of repairing the tissue. So this is the kind of tissue regeneration uh, that we work on. And our hypothesis here is that can you use silk in various of these organs to repair um, the uh, defective organ? 
So based on our expertise in processing silk into different forms, uh, I, along with my colleagues, Dr. Premnath and Dr. Ashish Lele, set up this company called as Serigen, which is a spin-off company from CSIR NCL. So the know-how about processing silk to develop biomedical implants was licensed from National Chemical Laboratory to the spin-off company. Uh, so incidentally, Seri, as I told you, means silk. Seri culture is silk-based agriculture. Seri in Latin means silk. And uh, regenerate, as I told you, is to bring back the organ to its functionality. So Serigen is actually using silk to regenerate uh, organs, right? So um, the technology, so the science for this um, using silk in various implants, we have done a lot of work in the last uh, uh, decade. And the science has been published in several high impact international reputed journals. We have publications in a nature journal. We have publications in American Chemical Society uh, journals. And um, we have been able to show that our products are really comparable to uh, what is available in the market or better. Uh, this technology is also protected by patents. Our patents have been granted in Europe, in the US, as a in Japan, and they're also under consideration in India. We hope that will happen uh, soon. So um, I'll tell you about the first or the flagship product for the company. The flagship product is in bone tissue engineering. So uh, basically, if you have a cavity in the bone, so cavities in the bone can be formed either because you had an accident. So sometimes an accident results in uh, powdering of the bone or uh, there is uh, some, an infection or a cancer that is there in the bone and the surgeon removes all this cancerous tissue from the bone, right? So if you have a very large cavity, which is like three to five centimeter in size, uh, the surgeon has to fill this up with a material which will support formation of new bone, right? So, uh, so what the surgeon does today is typically they will take out bone from the hip area of the patient and put it in this cavity. Now, when you have to take bone from the hip region of the patient or the iliac crest is uh, actually where they take it from, it means that you have to do two surgeries on the patient. It means longer hospitalization, longer recuperation times. It means huge discomfort to the patient. And uh, therefore, it would be nice if you can have a material that can be put into this cavity, which actually supports healing of this uh, tissue. And then it resolves over time, right? The tissue regeneration concept that I told you. So people have been working on various kinds of bioceramics that have been used to plug these materials. And in bone, bioceramics based on uh, hydroxyapatite, calcium phosphates, calcium sulfates. These are the ones that are used today. Some of them are exorbitantly priced. Uh, when you have a large cavity of three to five centimeters, these just don't work. So surgeons, in spite of having so many different options, still rely on autografting, which is taking bone from another location in the patient's body. And our motivation here was, can silk be used to fill up these cavities? So it should match the performance of the patient's own bone or autografting, but it should retain the convenience of use of using a synthetic material. So based on this, this is our flagship product called a Serios. Uh, Serios can be made in variety of different shapes and sizes. So depending on the anatomical site that the surgeon is looking at, we have these different sizes and shapes that are available. It is also available in the form of a putty. It is also available in the form of a powder. Right. What is interesting is that the silk thread, which is actually soft, we all know the silk sari is really soft uh, in texture. We have been able to process it in such a way that the mechanical properties of this are comparable to the mechanical properties of your cancellous bone. The, this also has large amount of porosity. So it's about 40% porous, which means that it is enough for the cells from the bone to actually migrate and uh, into this cavity. Right. Uh, we have so that is again comparable to cancellous bone. And uh, all this we have done by while retaining the inherent safety and the biocompatibility of the silk based material. So, although we are processing it using solvents, we have not compromised any way on the safety of the material. That is our uh, USP. So, what we did was we did a lot of lab studies as well as a lot of animal studies using this 
compared it with leading products. Now, Triocyte is a Zimmer uh, product stimulant is from Biocomposites, which is a US or a UK based company. Pronas is Depu, again, a US based company. These are materials that are being used by surgeons today in the market. And we have data to show that Serios performs at least two times better in all bone repair parameters compared to some of these leading products in the market. Uh, in terms of what that means for the patient is that the quality of the bone that is formed when you use serios versus any of these other materials is at least two times better, uh, which results, which means that there are no post-surgical complications. It reduces the risk of a repeat fracture for the patient and therefore brings in a lot of value, not only for the surgeon, but also for the patient, right? So uh, based on this, we also have the, uh, with the success on hard tissue or bone, we have now started looking at products in soft tissue. So we have two other products that we are working on. Seri Mat basically supports soft tissue regeneration. So uh, tissues like muscles is what it can support. Um, we Our first target market for this is breast cancer. So uh, when we do a breast reconstruction surgery, you can um, actually use Seri Mat to support the weight of the implant. It can be used in other reconstruction surgeries like vaginal wall reconstruction, abdominal wall reconstruction, and so on. Uh, Seri Mat is currently under clinical trials in Apollo Hospital in Bangalore, where the surgeon is using it for breast reconstruction surgery. Uh, we've recruited our first few patients for the clinical trial there. Uh, Seri Derm is a, a wound dressing. It's an advanced wound dressing product. So uh, it can be used for um, complex wounds such as diabetic foot ulcers, second degree burns, bed sores. So these are wounds which result in a lot of exudate. So if you dress the wound with a cotton gauge, the cotton gauge actually sticks to the wound. So when you have to dress it, it is very painful for the patient. So imagine you're peeling it off, it sticks to the wound, very painful for the patient and also interferes with the healing of the wound. So what Seriderm does is Seriderm is actually absorbent. So it absorbs all the exudate that is coming from the wound or all the liquid that oozes out of the wound, but it doesn't stick to the wound. So it's non-adherent. It is non-adherent and absorbent. And we have data in animal model, which shows that it is um, promotes faster and efficient healing compared to a lot of products that are available, uh, especially for diabetic uh, wound healing. Um, So, biomaterials in your labs, you need to make it into a device. You then do to prove that when you get permission from the uh, government or the government body, which is CDSCO, to actually do clinical testing. So I'm very proud to say that Serios is the first, uh, we are the first company globally to conduct clinical trials of using silk in bone. Uh, we have also got permissions to uh, do clinical trials with Serimat. So Serios clinical trials are being led by Dr. Chetan Pradhan, who is um, head of the orthopedics department at Sanjay Institute of Orthopedic Research. Um, we also have other hospitals such as uh, Jahangir Hospital where we are doing this clinical trial. And... Um, Seri Mat clinical trial, as I mentioned, is being led by Dr. Jayanti Tumsi, who is a very renowned oncosurgeon at Apollo Hospital in Bangalore. Uh, very recently, we have got our approval to manufacture Seriderm for sale. So we are doing a pilot launch of Seriderm in the Indian market in 2022. So we have engaged with a few distributors in India. And we have also set up our own manufacturing facility, which is compliant with ISO 13485, which is a global um, medical device manufacturing standards. Uh, so if you look at uh, tissue regeneration is a huge market globally. It is more than $10 billion uh, in 2020. It's growing with a CAGR greater than 14%. And it caters to various uh, domains of medicine, which include orthopedics, musculoskeletal, neurology, skin, dental, urology, gynecology, and so on. So we have products currently that cater to few domains over here. We're talking of skin, we're talking of orthopedics, and we're talking of breast cancer over here. Uh, but if you look at our product portfolio, it demonstrates that silk is a powerful and a versatile technology that can cater to various different things. It's a platform that can be used to solve complex challenges or problems in variety of these uh, medical sectors. 
So we believe that Cerigen will transform the tissue regeneration products company, and we intend to grow it, uh, grow it and make it into a global medical uh, devices company. That is the vision that the founders have for the company, and uh, we are actually moving towards um, that. So that was pretty much what I had. This is basically to summarize that it's a protein molecule which is naturally occurring. It's a green material, sustainable material, uh, and um, it has diverse applications, not only from traditional textiles to very state-of-the-art uh, tissue regeneration applications. Um, of course, a lot of people to thank in this journey. Uh, although I'm presenting this work today, as I mentioned, Dr. Ashish Lele and Dr. Premnath are also co-founders in the startup, Serigen. <coughs> Dr. Ashish Lele is the founder of Serigen. He's the director of CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. He's also my PhD advisor. Uh, Dr. Premnath, who is the founder director of Venture Center. He's also my colleague at NCL. And he's also the co-inventor on the patent for uh, silk and bone. I've been fortunate to have really good project assistants and PhD students who have worked with me in uh, developing some of these uh, technologies. Uh, the team at Serigen is led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Swati Shukla, who actually brings in the complementary skill sets. Uh, since I'm an engineer, she comes from a bio background. So we actually complement each other in developing these products. <coughs> uh, sorry. And I also have collaborators, Dr. Kanika Trivedi and Dr. Sayam, who have worked with me on the Color Silk project. Mm -hmm. NCL has been our technology partner, uh, as I've told you. We have been incubated at Venture Center, which is uh, NCL's technology business incubator. And uh, we have benefited immensely from the ecosystem at uh, Venture Center. Uh, we have recently graduated out from Venture Center, set up our own facility now for uh, manufacturing of Ceriderm. And uh, BIRAC has been instrumental in funding all of our activities so far. We have received several grants from BIRAC right from idea stage uh, to the animal stage and continue to get their financial support without which I think would not have been possible to uh, come to this stage. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention and again for giving me this opportunity to present our work here. And I'll happy, be happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope I've completed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. We really relish. And uh, from laboratory to a startup is a big journey. And uh, very few scientists are able to do so. We compliment on behalf of Tech Forum. This is one of the activity of Tech Forum, bringing university research or laboratory research into reality, into product and well generation. So you have set an example. We are very, really proud. Uh, friends, uh, we will open the session for question and answer uh, for another five to seven minutes. So please identify your name and then uh, ask question. Please shoot out. Hello, madam. I am Bhalia. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. It is a really amazing presentation. Uh, 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 not uh, of application of silk. Application of silk. Has has been looked at only as a clothing uh, material. Exactly. I'm hearing an echo. I'm not able to hear you. Maybe if others can yeah. mute their mic. It... Are you? Am I audible now? Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is. The silk was known only by normal people, know only as a clothing. So today we got the insights of you know so many applications, and it's really wonderful work what you have been doing. I think uh, wish you all the good luck for uh, the, 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 this new venture, and I think it is going to help the mankind uh, on the upcoming uh, this thing. Like you said, uh, today the implantation of liver. There are a lot of people you know they, they have to wait for the donors. So I think this technology can be used there, isn't it? Yeah. So we so far don't have a product for liver uh, tissue engineering. We are doing some basic research in um, doing that. But uh, in the future, yes, definitely, I think if there is a possibility. Currently, we have these three products that we have working on. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be also able to work in the liver tissue engineering as well. Uh, where is your organization? Where is this factory? Wherever uh, this facility in Pune? Uh, 
So we have it in um, electronic cooperative estate uh, on Satara Road. Basically. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, madam. There is a, a question put in chat box by Dr. Shashikala Gangal. Yeah. Uh, is Dr. Gangal is there? Okay, I just read the question. Yeah, uh, she has started. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, Gangal, uh, Dr. Gangal, please uh, ask your question. Hello. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, I was interested in knowing since I'm a material scientist. Sorry, sorry for interruption, Dr. Gangal. Please introduce yeah. yourself and I will ask the question. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Gangal. I was retired uh, from Pune University Electronic Science Department. I work in materials. Materials. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm always worried about the impurities and defects in the materials. And uh, therefore, would like to know uh, what are the defects and impurities and how do you deal with them? Right. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, the work that we do is mostly with mulberry silk, bombyx mori silk. Now, the silkworm feeds very exclusively on the mulberry leaves and protein synthesis generally does not involve a lot of impurity uh, because it comes through the, you know, you have the mRNA doing the transcription and getting it to uh, that, right? So therefore, the uh, chances of getting a lot of um, defects in the material is not there. Uh, impurities are possible only when... Um, the human intervention actually results in any uh, use of non-pure water or anything like that. But okay. a lot of farmers that we work with are actually uh, M.Tech graduates or PhDs themselves who mm -hmm. understand that this is going to be used in a medical application. The fact that it is used to make uh, silk sutures for medical devices, so mm -hmm. they do understand how much purity is of importance uh, to us. And we are very proud to say that so far we have never rejected a batch of silk that has come from any farmer. We have uh, three really great farmers that we work with. And uh, apart from that, we have our own internal QC tests that we use to ensure that there are no impurities that uh, are you know, taken forward when we make the products. No, but, but sometimes the uh, silkworms may be, uh, I mean, diseases. I mean, uh, I don't know about the diseases in them because I'm not... Uh, but yeah. uh, I mean, are you separate out those or uh, I mean, yeah. uh, selective? So, farmers are themselves actually trained. And I said, uh, mm -hmm. what they do is they actually, um, when they are rearing these silkworms, they do it in a very, very controlled environment. So silk diseases, a lot of times are very contagious. And at their end, they will do some sorting. If they see a disease, they will actually destroy that entire generation of mm -hmm. silkworms or and uh, so on. So they have their own protocols that they follow at their stage. Uh, plus, when we are taking the silk, for, after we take the silk from there, we actually mm -hmm. boil it in water and we have certain chemical treatments that we do. So that results in killing any of the microorganisms or anything uh, bacterial that uh, comes forward from those infections. So that is how we are able to actually maintain the quality of silk. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, next question, please. I think we are about to uh, close to 11 o'clock. So uh, if there are no questions, uh, I will uh, sum up the session. So friends, it was a wonderful session and totally different from what we did in the last six months. But uh, we are really proud to see a success story from a research laboratory to a reality into the market. Of course, uh, the product is under clinical trial and I'm sure very shortly it will come in the market and change the scenario. And this is the first effort in India where a scientist have worked and converted that product into an industry. A lot of people are doing research and Tech Forum, uh, this is one of the mandate that we support and help uh, the incubators or uh, small scale industries to, or those who are having idea to convert that into reality. And we have a program where we have 10 commandments for 
successful product development and we are working on that and last year we made one success story which will be uh, shortly shared with the members so thanks a lot i request all the participants to become tech forum member it's a ngo and it runs on the public support and it is not a profit making activity so join and 